How's it going? Yeah. Yep. Well, what are you doing? Going great. Yeah. Oh. Very good. Yes, mate. How are you doing? Yeah. Okay. Today, welcome to my Fight Clan. As usual, and today I'm going to introduce Sid. How are you doing, Sid? Yeah, I'm fine. Thanks. Uh, really good. Thank you. How about yourself? You good? Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for agreeing to come on. I appreciate it. Uh, I've seen your videos and uh, I like your content and um, some really interesting interviews. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. That's how we know each other, even though we don't know each other, as in we've never actually met, whether it be physical or this online version. This is a raw, straight in there, never met each <laughs> other, just had the odd communication uh, via YouTube and uh, Instagram, right? That's right, yeah. And that's how that's how I know Sid. And I noticed him because to me, going off of your videos and your chat, I think you're a fellow Hong Kong movie Kung Fu fan. Am I right? Yes. I, I love Hong Kong movies. I love Kung Fu cinema. And um, well, I like movies in general. I like you know, just the medium itself of black like, filmmaking. I'm an absolute kind of like, I am a cinephile, but since I was young, I've always been kind of like, I've had this kind of really kind of like urge of like just, I've, always, I've been in a constant rabbit hole. When it comes to like Hong Kong movies, martial arts cinema, even Asian cinema as well. So it's just like, we just kind of dealt from the Chinese language movies to Korea and even some Japanese and whatnot, just discovering like just anything I could find. Yeah. Well, how did it all come about though? Because see, the thing is, you said there you're into movies full stop in general, right? Which is fine. Yeah. Yeah, your, your channel was called Cool Movie Gram. So yeah. there's a, a hint there that you're just into movies. And when you watch your intros to your videos, they uh, just seem to be cover everything. But when you actually look at your videos, you seem to talk mostly about the Kung Fu. The thing is, it's because a lot of my, when I've realized one thing is like whenever I do like um, videos about Hong Kong movies, in particularly, it's like whether it's might be to do with martial arts movies or even if it's... Um, Covering movies that are starring Chai and Fat or directed by John Wu, they tend to get more views as well. I realized, I thought, okay, you know what? That's maybe an angle I should maybe cover a lot more. But my whole, the whole thing started, I was six years old, I remember, because my um, one of my uncles, he was a huge Bruce Lee fan and he loved martial arts movies. And he used to always show me these magazines and, and like um, clips and all that, saying, oh, Bruce Lee was so amazing, he was a really good martial artist. And, um, you know, he's fine. I didn't even know what martial arts was back then. I was only six years old. And right. I think it was on ITV. Enter the Dragon was actually playing on uh, in the evening. And my parents did not allow me to stay up and watch it. But my uncle, he had actually recorded it. So when I did go over to his house, I'd actually watched it for the first time. And, of course, as a six-year-old, I was thinking, what the hell did I just watch? This is just yeah. like probably the most amazing thing ever. Even though it was the scene with the, the version with the uh, the nunchuck scenes cut out, but um, I actually, you know, I just kind of went down a rabbit hole because my uncle had then, not so long after, had actually kind of rented um, Police Story and uh, Drunken Master off VHS, and that yes. kind of like. You know, it was the ranked video, Sam Seed Dove as well. That's the first version I saw. And <laughs> that just kind of like put me onto Jackie Chan. And um, since then, whenever I'd go over to his house, and we'd actually kind of like find like Jackie Chan movies that had actually kind of like rented off the video store. And then I think it was even well, later on for that because we are, where I live in Birmingham, there are a couple of video, like there used to be video shops, or even video libraries, like predominantly owned by like um, South Asians. So you'd get a lot of Bollywood movies in there where people would actually go watch them. But they'd also have a huge selection of like um, of kung fu movies. Like they had like all the old Imperial Entertainment, um, Jackie Chan and Samuel Hong kind of releases. So yeah. that kind of like put me onto a lot of like, I watched a lot of Jackie Chan movies, but when I started watching like, for example, I saw Project A and Wheels on Meals, that put me onto like, oh, who are these other guys? And then I started learning about Samuel Hong, Yun Byu, and uh, even Cynthia Rothrock, because I remember 
the uh, I think it was the, the VHS for Police Story Part Two, which had the um, the trailer for uh, Above the Law, Writing Wrongs on it before before the film starts. Yeah. And I was like, I need to see this movie, and that kind of got me up to like see the Rock Rock and God knows what. It's just, it, and then I think Channel Four was also doing a lot of like playing like Hong Kong movies late night, and I used to actually buy black VHS cassettes and used to actually tape a lot of them and rewatch them over and over again. And I think it was, I was at the time, I think it was maybe like my early days of like secondary school when I was about 13, 14. Um, there's that channel Bravo, they actually played like a bunch of Hong Kong movies. They played a lot of um, like the John Woo films like Hard Boiled, A Better Tomorrow, The Killer, Bullet in the Head. I even saw films like Chinese Ghost Story. And you know that kind of got me into more of like the whole the Hong Kong cinema cinema kind of like thing more than just martial arts. But I think it was maybe because when I was kind of like get, got into like martial arts movies really well. I think it was around about the age of thirteen. I uh, I started studying kickboxing at um, at some local clubs, and then I went on to study a bit of uh, Lao Ga Kung Fu. All right, and wait, 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 wait. Let's wait for the real martial arts. Hang on, because I've got lots of chats and follow-ups to do on what you've already said. So, yeah. first off, what's the name of your uncle? My uncle's name is Mukhtar. <laughs> uncle Mukhtar, you're the best, right? Same as me, Uncle Peter. You're the best because it's our uncles that exposed us to this. Maybe we got would have got exposed to this stuff at some point anyway. But for me and you, our yeah. stories are really, really similar because it was uncles that got us into it and uh, respect to them for doing that. I don't really know why they liked this stuff. Um, probably the same sort of feeling that we get. And most people get it. Not everybody, but a lot of people see this stuff, not necessarily as adults, but certainly from a young age. It's very, yeah. very inspirational things that you see on the screen, right? And from your explanation of when you saw Enter the Dragon and then Police Story, sounds to me like you were very, very inspired when you saw these things because it isn't normal, is it? It's no, not it normal. No. Even, it still even by right? today's standards, even by today's standards, they've got like, yeah. for example, martial arts made a big impression, for example, around about the late 90s, especially when... Yeah, Jackie Chan kind of finally breaking the mold with Rush Hour and Rumble in the Bronx. But then yeah. not so long after, you had films like The Matrix, which kind of like utilized Yun Wu Ping. And um, that kind of had that Hong Kong style of action. And even the way that the, the fight scenes there were shot were pretty much yeah. how you would see them in a Hong Kong movie. And I think even up until now, because since then it's just grown, but it's like, they just still don't have that kind of like that magic that you'd see in like in Hong Kong films, like the fight choreography. I mean, it's like I love the John Wick films. I thought that they were absolutely incredible. I think the way that they were made is really good, and they use utilization of fight choreography and cinematography was great. But then, well, how about looking at the fight scenes? For example, like if you want to compare modern day action, look at the fight scenes at the end of films like Eastern Condors or even Millionaires Express. Yeah, and you you see like you know there's just that raw gritty impact that you had in in Hong Kong movies, just kind of like especially of that era where like yeah. you had people like Jackie Chan, Sammo Hung, Yun Bu, they were all like at the top of their game, and you'd see like just the brilliance. And I, I think it's the same with to, because even though they got all the advanced technology they have like you know at, to their resources at the moment, but then. Even without that, it just still looks a lot better. It stood the test of time. That's what I would, what I really enjoy about a lot of these martial arts movies. Well, it's a good point that you raised there, Sid, because by the time me and you were watching these films, it sounds like our timelines are very, very similar. End the Dragon, then on to Jackie Chan. Then when you watch Jackie Chan, you then uh, see Sammo Hung, Yun Biu. Then you watch the trailers. Those trailers were very important to us, as you say, on those videos. So we got to see things at the same sort of time so our timelines are the same so i know we're talking from the same same place here but the point you raised there about the modern day films and when we watch these films when we were watching these jackie chan Sammo hung films they mm -hmm. were as you rightly say there they were at their peak if you like because oh, definitely they people were watching them they were well established in their careers not to us it was new stuff new material mm -hmm. but they were deep 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 into their careers at this point so we're getting 
them at their best. You know what I mean? So that's why when we're watching it, we're a bit blown away like it. We haven't really grown into it like, say, the Asian audiences probably have seen them from young all the way all the way through. We're watching mm -hmm. them and we're blown away immediately because we're watching it at their best. These American films that are trying to copy it, mimic it, they've been doing that for many, many years now. And they're nowhere near it, in my yeah. opinion. They're still nowhere near it. Not even the Matrix, because all as good as that was for its time, and you could see the influence of the Hong Kong and Yun Wu Ping being used in there. It was still, you know, Lawrence Fishburne and uh, and Keanu Reeves who had gone off and done a little bit of training to to look good on the film. It still wasn't those guys, and I don't expect them to look like those guys because now no, I you know. Can't. We, because knowing what we know, right? These guys are they were trained from young young kids exactly like before, I mean, like this, and then by the, the time they watch those films, they're well established in their career, right? Exactly. I mean the whole that whole peaking up opera kind of like um generation like, for example, we had the China drama drama academy where Jackie Chan, some of them, the Yuns, is more like Yun Bu and all them, they all kind of like came from there. And then also the, the rivals which had like um people like Lam Ching Ying and a few others are pretty yeah. much like they they were like pretty much that that was where a lot of the backbone of like Hong Kong stunt work came into play because that's how good they were because they started up pretty much at the bottom and that was well, that school that generation is pretty much responsible for even the action movies that we're getting at the moment I mean it's like they've had they kind of they've cemented their mark in in action cinema. Correct, correct. So when you watch films like John Wick, I mean you're still saying that you know you still like those. But in your mind, when you're watching it, I guess you can't help but compare it to the top, top action and choreography that you've seen. You can't help it, right? Yeah, yeah, you, I, I do like them because, I mean, you do, you even see a lot of, like, glimpses of Hong Kong cinema when watching something like John Wick because Chad Stahelski, he was also, um, he was the double for uh, Keanu Reeves in The Matrix. And he had also, he'd studied martial arts as one of Brandon Lee's, like, classmates. And I think that probably they both studied together. And right. Chan Stahelski himself has even said, and like many times is on record, that you know Hong Kong cinema is the reason why he got into kind of like making action movies because that's the kind of action that he enjoys the most in terms of like fight choreography and everything as well. So, and because of the fact that he was also working on the set of like films like The Matrix and whatnot, because he was working with a seasoned, respected veteran like you would think must have exposed him more to like how they make their movies and everything and, and sure, you kind of see that as well because i mean biggest example is that for example i think the John films have done something right that what a lot of like um let's say the hollywood movies of jet lee for example like look at if you look at like the fight sequences in romeo must die and cradle to the grave which were pretty much the shot and edited a lot like MTV music videos and it's just mm -hmm. kind of like really quick cuts and everything. Whereas yeah. with John Wick, you actually see these stunt people actually going through all these motions and you can actually the cameras pulled back a little, which we're like we're used to seeing that because that's how a lot of Hong Kong movies were shot. And I think as like someone who's like a student of film, I could see that Chad Stahelski himself has actually seen a lot of these films and he saw how it works and how the fight scenes even look more impactful. I mean, if you've ever seen that TV show Warrior, which was based on the uh, the Bruce Lee uh, idea, I mean, the fight the fight choreography and that is pretty much like in that same vein. You mean there's a lot of nods to Bruce Lee in terms of like how Andrew Koji actually fights, but then even the way that the actual fight scenes are choreographed, and shot, and filmed, it, and edited, it's pretty much a lot of what what you would normally get to see in like those golden era Hong Kong movies. And okay. you know, well, people well, understand well, that. Well, I've not watched Sorry? it. I've not watched yeah. Warrior. So yeah, you you recommend it, yeah? Oh, it's 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 incredible. It is absolutely because the fact is that it's not just like, for example, someone just doing a cash grab on the name of Bruce Lee. It's like you could tell from everyone from the, the actors, the writers, the fight choreographers, the stunt teams, they're all actually big fans. They love Bruce Lee and they've actually kind of like it's like a labor of love. It's like you could actually kind of like, yeah, you know what, this is how it should have been done. I mean, it's, the fight scenes in, in that show definitely probably better than nearly everything I've seen in any Hollywood movie, like in terms of my class. Okay, yeah, well, that's high praise indeed, you know. But I mean, not that it takes much to beat the Hollywood films, but <laughs> as you say, they are new to the game still, even though they've been, it feels like they've been doing it for ages. To me, 
they're still new to the game. But if you're seeing these improvements, then that's good. It was always going to be a tricky, a tough task, right, to try and mimic those because you haven't got the same performers, you know. But there is a lot of good people out there now that are very, very talented. Definitely. You, you, you've seen a lot in Brett Chan is an amazing choreographer. And um, even people who have worked on like the John Wick movies. And I mean, you see, these, these are the people who actually have a love for these films that like, for example, that people like us have kind of like known to love and cherish over the years. These, these people have that same kind of love and they understand the language of of film, of cinema, and they're able mm -hmm. to kind of like, you know, see this is how it should be done. Not just yeah. like, for example, I um, can't remember who it was. I remember having a discussion many years ago. They were saying, you know, they're trying to bring martial arts into a lot of kind of things and they use a lot of doubles. Like, for example, there's a scene, there's, someone was saying there's a scene in one of the episodes of like Buffy the Vampire Slayer where three hits, like three kicks, like three kick combo is done with three different shots. Yeah. And it just kind of like just to cover up the fact that it's not Cher and Michelle Geller. Whereas if you look at, like, for example, if you go back to like the Shaw Brothers movies or even the Golden Harvest era and even throughout like, Hong Kong, like more or less fight choreography, those three kicks probably would be done in one long take where you could actually see yeah. the kicks actually being performed. Well, I think they, they prided themselves on that, the fact that they could do it. They showed you, you know, oh, yeah. a lot of the times on the stunts and that where they would do stuff, they would they would pan out, show the shot of the stunt or whatever, and then they would purposely, like Armour of God, when he's up on the rock and he's abseiling down it, they purposely then go, all right, well, now we'll zoom in and prove this actually Jackie Chan abseiling down it. So I think they pride themselves on showing that they could actually perform these things, you Definitely. know? Yeah. And, and it Definitely. shows, doesn't it, on the screen? It shows. That's, that's, right? just, that's just their talent. That's, that's where they... Um... You know, that's how they made their money. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, so going back to the to the older films then, where mm -hmm. you first got into it and stuff. So we've got the Channel 4 series. That was exactly the same for me. I remember watching a lot of films on there. Like you say, picking up on the other actors and actresses that you see. Cynthia Rothrock was the same for me. I was never that bothered about things like China O'Brien and stuff like that because I, at the time, was a little bit more, I don't know, I'll call it a bit, bit more snobby about it you know because i was watching hong kong films if yeah. then someone told me well that's a load of crap you need to watch blood sport for example i'd go okay and i'd watch blood sport and go what's, what's that blood what's this this is not you you know i was watching say project a and they're watching blood sport i'd be no 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 this is miles apart so when i saw exactly. when i followed uh, her career and i was watching say yes madam um you know police assassins um lady reporter and stuff like that when i was watching those films i was like she's brilliant but then when i watched china o'brien i go okay i still liked it right i like keith cook and i like richard norton but i liked richard norton because i'd seen him in the hong kong stuff so i exactly. still see, you know i could still see elements of it there but those ones i still watched them but they weren't my thing but it's because now i'm a bit more open to watching more stuff and taking it for what it is mm -hmm. but when i was a lot younger you know i was a bit like well same with video games right someone is playing this and you're playing something else and it was always that competitive thing and go yeah but i'm i'm playing this and this is better than that and they're like well, no, hang on a minute amstrad is better than that and i go well i got commodore 64 and i go i mean one of them was the best one ever and he went yeah but i've got green screen i went well you've just said it all you have the screen's green of course it's not as good but commodore 64 is in color you know but it was the same thing <laughs> on from there you know snes mega drive uh, you know yeah. master system and nes then snes mega drive you know, and then there was a point when I was playing Neo Geo and they were still playing. They were they were saying, oh, I've just played this game, Fatal Fury or Sam, Samurai Showdown. And they were playing it on Mega Drive and SNES. And I'm like, well, I'm playing it on real Neo. I'm playing the actual the actual thing. So there was always that competitive thing with video games and with with the martial arts film. So I did watch all that stuff, but it didn't have the same impact. But I'm much more open and accepting of it now because obviously I've matured, aren't I? Yeah, I know because I, I actually I, I actually did get, get the uh, the Blu-ray and I only watched uh, China Ryan again after many years yesterday, and I was okay. watching like um, I saw Cynthia Rothrock's interview and she was saying how like because even though it's an American movie but it was a Golden Harvest production that um, there were actually the Weintraubs and Raymond Chow were kind of like at loggerheads because Raymond Chow wanted to get. The Hong Kong action stunt to do all the fight choreography, um, whereas 
uh, Bob Klaus and um, Fred Weintraub, they wanted to actually bring in like, American style uh, martial arts fighting. So some of it, you do get some of the fight scenes, you do have a bit of that flavor of Hong Kong, but then it is obviously a bit watered down. And then some of it just seems like this the sluggish kind of like stuff that you'd expect in like the 80s American action movies as well. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's interesting because I remember when me and my brother uh, met Cynthia recently at one of the Comic Cons and she said, I'm making this new movie, Black Creek. And the thing that yeah. we said to her was, well, can you make sure that you put some Hong Kong style action in? You know, that's the stuff that we like. And her response was, look, I know, I know that stuff is brilliant, but with all these people I've got involved, they have their own thing, their own styles. I can't ask them to do that kind of thing. They have to do their kind of thing, which I thought, you know, that makes sense. Yeah, true. Even I mean, though we want Hong Kong movies. styles, but it makes sense, right? If they're not that inclined to doing it they've got to do what their strengths are you know exactly it's just like um i mean you gotta understand that back in them days there was that like, very little safety in terms of like the well-being of stunt performers in hong kong mm, and exactly you know if they said you know what uh you know just put some apple boxes and some mattresses out and you know you, you, yeah. you'll be fine you know jump from the burning building you'll be okay yeah. <laughs> but now it's, i think now even Hong Kong and China, like when they're making their movies, they have got more safety provisions because I mean I can see that's more important because you don't want people dying on a movie set and you know think about it. If someone if a, if a stuntman gets injured in a way they could probably lose their way of actually making a living. So I think in a yeah. way that can be quite positive, but in the, in, you know you can't really but but of course that level of quality that you got from those movies with the death to find stunt work and like crazy bike choreography and falls and flips you think you, you ain't going to get there and you get anything like that at all right i don't think i think that era is not going to happen again hence why you referred to it earlier as the golden era and oh that's definitely exactly because it. that's when like martial arts movies were pretty much at the air you know at the, pen, at the peninsula of their like of the height really it's just like they've done so well yeah and then lots you know, of different ingredients at, at the right time that made it all work like you say so yes and yeah. even now because when you got these booty films like uh, Eureka 88 films Arrow and whatnot they're actually putting out these like great restorations like you know 2k 4k HD like yeah. looking absolutely pristine and you know they kind of get bring back the original like mono or dolby like stereo sound and you watch these films in, at, you know on your new tvs and you think they still hold up it's like um i remember watching like not long ago or a few weeks back i was watching the uh, marshall club the uh, local own movie against one of my yeah. my favorite yeah, I know movies. well yeah and i mean watching the 88 films the uh, blu-ray and you're thinking this movie still looks amazing and like sometimes it's hard to tell that you're watching an old movie because it's just like the picture quality is so well preserved and it's well made the film that like i mean i remember when um i think my son was probably about eight nine years old and i had showed him snake and eagle shadow for the first time he had been familiar with jackie chan because he's in rush hour here and there but then when i showed him snake and eagle shadow he was just absolutely glued to the screen Yes, in, yes, that glued me to the screen. Film. That done me. Snake and Eagle Shadow done me as well when I was a kid, probably around six, seven as well. That's when I got, that's when that was it. That was when it was over. I'm like, oof, I'd seen a little bit of other stuff before that, but that was the one that made me go, oh, you know, I've got to, I've got to continue watching this stuff. And I remember speaking to Rodney, you, you'll have heard of Rodney. I was speaking to yeah, him. Rodney, yeah. And, yeah, and he brought up a, a very good point about why kids are sort of attracted by that because you have another example there's another friend of mine who knows me and he also put that on for the kids just the intro they're only young and he put that on for them and said you know see what they think it is and they'd seen plenty of other things not being glued to it not bothered easily distracted and they stuck to that like glue as well you're saying is the same for your for your son right you're saying it's the same yeah. for your son exactly the same for me and and rodney brought up a good point that he thinks it might be the animal styles that attract people or certainly kids, because mm. and that did make sense to me. I didn't think about it when I was watching it at the time. It does, but also Snake, it, it, cat, tiger claws and all that. I mean, there is exactly you know, it makes sense. But I also think that what might attract like a lot of kids, especially because 
everybody loves the underdog story. I mean, even when it comes to movies itself, like for example, Rocky, I mean, the reason why that was so successful because it was about an underdog fighter giving that one shot. Whereas, I mean, Snake and Eagle Shadow, for, for example, that's about an, a downtrodden man who's kind of like, you know, always re- on the receiving end of like every bad situation. And yeah, he's actually given that chance to kind of rise up. He's actually kind of like given that chance to train and become like, you know, someone who could defend himself and stand up against the bad guys. And that's what also, I think that's what also appeals to children in general as well, because the kids actually like that kind of stuff. We've seen that story of like, it's like Peter Parker, he gets kind of like, you know, bullied. He's kind of seen as like an awkward nerd, gets bit by a spider, kind of like becomes this hero. And Mm. all kids love Spider-Man and like, as far as I'm aware. And it's the same thing with like, for example, when you see a lot of these Kung Fu movies where like even the Karate Kid, Daniel LaRusso is like getting picked right. on and then gets trained by Mr. Miyagi to kind of like yeah. stand up with the boys. Yeah, so well, that's I mean, a good the point. That karate karate kid. Kid. which kind of like, yeah, yeah you're, you're actually... No, you're right, Sid. That Karate Kid, see, I liked that film, even though it would, to me wasn't a proper Kung Fu film and I was watching real Kung Fu films. I still loved that film because I love, it's just a good film, right? The essence of that film. Yeah, it's a good and, movie. And that, yeah. yeah, that's a brilliant point you, you raise about the kids and what they get from these films because as you say ching fu in uh, you know jackie chan in snake and eagle shadow he's bullied and a lot of kids are bullied yeah. um, you know, he's taken the mick out of made fun of and he, like you say he gets the opportunity through having a mentor which could be related to a good teacher at school or a family member or their own parents and, you know a good mentor a role model is in sam seed in this in this and or old man in snake and eagle shadow and like you say <laughs> then there's someone to look up to and someone that gives them the opportunity and proves that they can flourish. And and that is a very, very good point. And that brings me on to the fact that you chose something like Snake and Eagle Shadow to show a youngster. Now, we grew up with BBFC and certifications, and that would have been a film, as we saw with Enter the Dragon, where your parents went, you're not allowed to watch this. And they were very good, responsible parents because they they can't be watching every single film that comes out. So they need some sort of guide. And that's what it was. It was a guidance for parents to go, OK, he's not ready for this. That's what they say, whether they're right or wrong. Like my mum and dad, they they used that 18 certificate on The Warriors, for example, and they made their own decision watching it and knowing the film. They made their own decision. And I was 10 and they said, this is an 18 certificate we're being told he shouldn't be watching it but they made watched it themselves and went right are we okay and we comfortable with this and they went yeah he's gonna love this film so they, you can make your own decision but they can't do that with everything so with snake and eagle shadow you are told by that little stamp on the front this is no good for your boy for whatever reason violence this that and the other but i never saw those films as violent or anything i saw them as very very wholesome you know i think i've turned out all right You've obviously turned out all right. You, you know, I, tell me about that decision to go. Was it because of how it made you feel? Because you're not supposed to be showing him that. You know, a Grand Theft Auto video game, too right. You know, teenagers, little kids shouldn't be playing that. Oh, right? they should. <laughs> Correct. You know, in my, that's just my opinion, by the way. That's just my opinion. But those ones, I went, well, no, you, you're not ready for this. This is not something. But Kung Fu films, I had no issue with it. I had no issue. There was barely, it wasn't really any bloody horror. You know, there wasn't really any real gore type violence, sure, brothers aside, no. but we couldn't really get hold of that stuff at the time anyway. So just explain to me a bit more about your your boy and your comfortable decision of sharing a, a Kung Fu film with him. Yeah, because it's the same thing, because I did not see that film as overly violent. I mean, it got an 18 certificate, but then the fact is, I mean, even when it was, for example, re-released on DVD, it still had, like, or Hong Kong Legends released it on DVD, it was still in 18. And the fact is that, when, but the fact is that Fearless Hyena, which when it was on VHS, that was in 18, but when it got re-released on DVD by Hong Kong Legends with the Ultra Bit, it was then re-certificated for, as a 15. And I thought, always thought this, that Fearless Hyena is probably one of the more violent, gruesome Jackie Chan movies in terms of the ones that he's directed. I always felt it had like more of a bloody kind of feel to the fight scenes, like attacks to the throat and everything as well. That's it. And um, what about the defense for the throat move though? Best defense, isn't it? Describe it. Oh. Remember the defense? 
<laughs> yeah, brilliant. I always used to try that. That school. Yeah. I thought that was kind of gruesome, but then when I saw uh, Snake and Eagle Shadow, and I thought, this isn't really as brutal or violent, and I thought, you know, this, yeah. is, this isn't really too kind of like, you know, there's nothing here that's too gruesome where, you know, that could kind of like disturb a child, and I thought there's nothing into it. Because even with the impact, there's not really as much blood as you, as like you would probably see in a Shaw Brothers film. Like for example, right. I wouldn't I, would, I wouldn't have shown my my child at the time. I wouldn't have shown him something like Boxer from Shang Tung, which had like an absolutely blood soaked ending, or you know something like Vengeance, or even like you know a lot of the Shaw Brothers stuff, or even any, any of the Chang Chai films, right? <laughs> any of Chang Chai's films are very bloody, but still comic booky to me. I never. Even though there was limbs getting hacked, I wouldn't have shown them either. I appreciate where you come from, and I agree with you. But you know, when I watched those right. films personally, I still didn't. I just saw them as demonstrating skills on screen. And uh, even though there was, say, Master Ventures, and there were Master Ventures, and there was blokes on balls and tr tridents being thrown in their throats and everything, you know, I kind of, I remember I watched that particular film with two young kids. I mean, they weren't that young. They were teenagers, 11, 12. They were a bloke I worked for at the time. They were his sons. And um, they, they were a Chinese family, and they were obviously confused that I was watching this Chinese stuff. And in a way, I kind of got the dad and <laughs> back into it because he thought, well, people think this stuff's crap. And there was me and my brother going, we love this stuff. And it kind of gave him the confidence to go, all right, well, I like this stuff as well, really. You know, so we started bringing films around because he didn't have nothing, and we started watching them. And I remember one of them, well, it was loads, but I remember one of them being Master Avengers. And when the bloke's chatting oh. and he's he's all strung up, and they throw the trident in his throat, and it go, you know, obviously the middle bit goes oh. in and the two bits around the time, and he goes, ah! ah, and the kids laughed, and one of them said. How can he scream if the trident's in his throat? And I thought, there you go. It's just the way you view it. And they laughed it, you know? It is, so. because I, I, I think that, for example, if kids can kind of like, if, if, you, if you raise your children right, they can kind of differentiate from right from wrong. Like, for example, it's like, I think I was around about like, like 12 or 13 or something. And that was the first time I saw a film like Hard Boiled, where you got like people just getting shot up in the hospital and everything like that. Right. And but the thing is, I could tell that it was fake. You know, I thought it, it's not a real situation, it's a movie. Because I mean, by that time, I mean I'd seen enough stuff on like, for example, on TV and whatnot, and how they make action movies, and they are so I knew about like blood squibs and uh you know, control stunt work and everything all that. But okay, so they're just pretending to shoot each other. So, you know, it's not like it's a, it's a real gun or anything. So I kind of knew that because it doesn't look like, because the one thing I would have to say is that violence, I mean, in reality, it just looks absolutely ghastly and unsightful because I mean, when you watch a movie and, and it looks cool, that's because it's kind of being stylized. And you know it's fake because it just does not look pretty like that. Whereas, I mean, biggest example is if you've uh, ever seen a film, films like, for example, um, uh, I think Scorsese, he's a filmmaker that when he makes a violent scene, he makes it look very kind of like just sickening and like, it's just like, ugh, you know, this isn't really pretty to look at. And that's yeah. what pretty much is it's a harsh reality of life where violence itself can kind of like is destructive and it's disgusting and like it's kind of like it's does it's not meant to be kind of like something that's entertaining in that sense. It, like where you know, you know, someone's just beating up someone till they're bloody to a pulp or something like that. But yeah, or, like you say, the it's the intention, it was there to to entertain and not you know, uh, make you angry or disgusted or anything like that but you see again you raise some very very good points here that we're now talking about this and thinking well these bbfc blokes i'm sure i don't know if they watch these films start to finish i believe they did because they cut loads of stuff out but your uncle <laughs> made the decision and went no i'm okay for him to see this my uncle also made the decision my brother's three years older than me but obviously that means i'm three years younger than him so i was younger and he also made the decision and my dad, obviously, and my mum and dad trusted him yeah. and said, yeah, of course, no problem. And we're all good. And it just goes to show that I believe that they're making mistakes with this stuff because their intentions may have been right. But a lot of people now, because we're older and we can look back on these things, 
and we can we also now part of this modern generation and we're looking at the certification and going well these films are okay you know there were no sex in them no real violence and no real bad intentions and the good guys always won right so yeah. the, the themes were good um the morals the ethics were good you know you had no problem even watching snake and eagle shadow because you saw like you say the underdog story and that was a good thing to show now though we can go on x twitter you know now now known as x now the kid gets his phone he's got internet and he's got a phone they all want a phone and they can go on that now and there's basically no censorship and the things that you're saying that the real violence that is disgusting and unbearable people are getting conditioned to that now i believe because they're able to view that we were watching as you say hard boiled that was our violence now now look what was theatrical. that was theatrical is that even tarantino movies they're, they're theatrical you know they're not like you know absolutely bloody so they're the blood salt but then it's just not they, they look they look stylized and theatrical and it's just doesn't look realistic where well, that's the whole point it's it's not realistic it's an actual yeah. movie you know yeah. you're in a movie it's a fictional setting where i mean films like for example if you watch movies like casino and goodfellas which are based on true stories by scorsese yeah. i mean the violence in that just doesn't look pretty at all and that's probably what that is what the filmmakers were going for where violence is bad it just yes. it is absolutely disgusting it's like it is not it's not meant to be pretty in real life yeah, that's right. And then you'll watch that film or films like those two you mentioned, Goodfellas and Casino, and you'll say to yourself, well, this is bad. And you'll leave, you'll be left with that impression that this is a side of life that exists, that you're being exposed to via a film and an entertaining film to watch. Exactly. But something you don't want now to do with, you know? Exactly. You don't want to have any involvement in that kind of life anyway. So it's like, no. you know, Interesting, that, that, though, the way you can where you can look at these things, but we're doing it obviously with hindsight, and things have changed, and you know, and they're bringing these certifications down, like you say, 18s are now becoming 15s. And as much as I go, okay, well, this should never have been an 18 in the first place. I also look at the changing tastes, mm -hmm. and I, it, it kind of worries me as well because I go, well, why are you guys now saying that this is okay to be a 15? And it obviously is because of what they're able to watch and what they see that is way more, you know, I don't know bad to watch now than, than Snake and Eagle Shadow or whatever, you know? Exactly. I mean, I think even, even like when it comes to like the BBFC ratings and everything, they, they have become a lot more relaxed these, uh, this, well, for the last 20 odd years because, um, yeah. to be honest, films that were kind of being censored at the time when you watch that stuff now, I mean, I've seen horror movies that have come out uh, that are a hell of a lot more gruesome. Yeah, right. And they're 15s you know, and stuff. And you look at it and go, what's happened here? It's like they're passing the cuts. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, that's the thing that always gets me. It's like, why is it, it hasn't become so but hard to get hold of that, the saw in the head scene from the big boss? I mean, I've seen like, I've seen worse stuff happen in a lot of horror movies. <laughs> of course. Well, we'll just take that. The, the fact that you use the word saw, we'll go with those films. Saw. I mean, there's so much. Look at what's in those films. All these films. Yeah, they are gruesome. They are very fucking gruesome. Yeah. Right? And I watch these films and I go, I'm sometimes sitting there and I check and go, what certification is this? And it's 15. I think 15. I mean, there's so much stuff in, not just violence, but the things they say and, you know, and, and imply and even do. And I go, 15. So yeah, it's definitely changed. They have they have got like you know they have gotten more relaxed and kind of like I guess it depends just depends on one person's perspective they can differentiate from reality and fictional I mean then you should be okay because I mean I've never had violent tendencies or anything like that because yeah. I've watched a lot of violent movies but it right. just never made me want to kind of like you know go and do something like i don't know go and do like a mass killing or something like that because i know for a fact if you see this stuff happening in movies it happens in the movies because it's it's all fictional you know it's not going to happen in real life it would never go down like this <laughs> no you, you listen you, you bang on right obviously it starts at home the way you're raised and it's about who mm -hmm. you who you are it don't matter how much grand theft auto you play it don't matter how many films that you watch that have got this that and the other in it's either in here or you ain't you know you can you can get bad ideas from it but it's about whether you're going to act them out or whatever and as you say i never even contemplated anything of the sort 
So yeah. No, I mean my my my, my son plays uh well. Not at the moment, but he has played like uh, Grand Theft Auto. I mean, he's, he's, he's in the midst of his uh, GCSE exams now anyway, so, you know, he's spending more time making sure he can get them past them. So, but yeah. he has played Grand Theft Auto, but to be honest, my son's never been into that kind of a crowd at the moment as well. And like, I would say, I'm glad, you know, he can kind of differentiate from right and wrong. And he's even, you know, he's, he's got to the point where he knows where, what kind of people to stay away from, what kind of people to kind of like, you know, you know, like yeah. you can look at you can kind of like, you know, who's good and who's very important. Right. So as long as you raise your kids right, that's 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 what matters really. Yeah, and as you say, then the influence from the people that they associate with and hang around with, right? This is all this is all part of growing up, and there's going to be mistakes that are made, and we appreciate that. But you've got to be there for them and put them back on the straight and narrow if needed, right? That's it. Definitely. Yeah, it is. That that's how it works. Yeah. Yeah. All right, look, before you go, there are more things I want to discuss with you, but obviously, if you don't mind, you could come back on because we haven't gone on to real martial arts, and I'd obviously like to chat about that. But before you go, I must ask you briefly about um, collecting. So obviously, back then, you were watching this stuff. You mentioned old video shops and stuff like that. We are are very, very, very on the same timeline here, Sid, right? The the story you tell is like listening to my own story, really, yeah. with growing up with these video shops and the uncle and stuff like that, and Snake and Eagle Shadow and Enter the Dragon. I mean, it's very, very similar. So we had a very, very similar experience with martial arts and kung fu films, and I'm sure we have one similar with actual martial arts as well. But when it comes to those video shops and stuff, what, what yeah. and you said, you said, you said it yourself, right, with the TV stuff. You made sure you set it up to record. You didn't set it up. You probably actually record it at the time that it started because we didn't, yeah. we didn't always have timer records and stuff like that, or I didn't know how to use it. And then you had the film and you watched it over and over and over oh, yeah. again. And that's what happens with these films. That's why they have such, especially at the time when you're watching them, they have such an affinity with you because they never leave you because they are the ones where you're absorbing the most Definitely. most information. They say when your brain is taking on the most information while we can't learn a new language now or we struggle to because our brains have got so much else to deal with or it's older or whatever and at the time i weren't trying to learn new languages i was watching dubbed kung fu films <laughs> right <laughs> and that's what stayed with me so if i could watch a, an old 1970s kung fu film now and in a week i won't remember it but it's not because it's crap i just won't remember it but the ones that i watched back then over and over and over again they don't leave me. They are there. The the the, exactly. the, the, yeah, line, the dubbing, the the scenes. They just don't go. And 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 that's because obviously that I was fully immersed and I totally absorbed them. And it sounds like you did too. So apart from the ones off the TV, did you did you manage to collect stuff and VHSs back then? Oh, definitely, I did. I um, thing is, uh, there were a couple of the video shops. I was able to get like some. Uh, some some ex rentals like for example some of the imperial entertainment ones made in hong kong like label like vhs's and i think a couple of eastern heroes because i was one of those guys that when i was young and i used to go into like h and or tower records i used to be stuck in the section where you'd see all these like made in hong kong eastern heroes uh mia videos like they would think the end of the 90s they were released as hong kong classics they just had a bunch of like kung fu martial arts hong kong cinema movies and me not being 18 at the time i was too young to actually go and purchase some of these but i did manage to kind of pick up a few select like 15 certificate 15 kind of ones that i could and right. um, i was able to kind of like buy like i did buy like a few at the time and then also there used to be I found a local, well, kind of local to me. It was a shop. It was run by a Vietnamese guy, and the shop's name was Lam Bi in Birmingham. It's like in the Low Zales Hansworth area, and um, in Birmingham. And he used to have a lot of these films on VCD and also VHS. So it's like a lot of May R and Universe kind of that. And they had a bunch of Hong Kong movies that some of these films that that were that he had available. They yeah. were not really, they have not been released in the UK yet. He had a you bunch of them. AR, yeah, this kind of things I've got, yeah, yeah, things you would never exactly. See. And that just kind of again, it just expanded my kind of like my whole forte in terms of like my uh, 
my palate coach for Hong Kong cinema because yeah. I at one point I started off it was just strictly martial arts or um, like stuff people like Jackie Chan, Sammo Hong, Yoon Bu, Bruce Lee, you know even Jet Li to an extent as well like it kind of yeah. became like a big mainstay but then I started learning more about other people because of that shock there because they had like pretty much different directors like all these different movies that were made in different mm-hmm. genres and you kind of like yeah. you know it's just yeah, you know, I started collecting anything I could. I just started buying whatever kind of like movies I could anyhow. Like, I mean, I I think um, when I went to uh, when I went to university in Manchester in uh, Chinatown, there were some great shops that would like sell DVDs from Hong Kong. Yeah, and, like, yeah the Chinatown back in the days. Yeah, yeah, they were great. Yeah, and I just I just picked up loads. I just picked up a lot of these movies, and I was like, oh, you know, they're on DVD. Awesome, you know. Oh, I picked that up. I picked that up, and <laughs> not realizing I was actually spending a lot of money that was that I had was going towards like DVDs and God knows what. <laughs> and you're still doing it. You just told me you bought China O'Brien. <laughs> you're still doing it. I oh, know. Yeah. Right. Uh, it ain't trust close. me. <laughs> I have to kind of limit now because the missus it's is not too happy with. She's not happy with how big my collection's getting. She's like, "Why have you got all these movies for?" <laughs> yeah, and and why have you got this movie five times? You know, yeah. oh, well, that's because it came out on. It, I recorded it off the telly, then it came out on VHS and an X rental. So I managed to buy that because of in the old video shops, he didn't care when I used to ask him. You know, uh, can I buy this off you now? They didn't care. That it was an eighteen. I'm like, yeah, no worries or whatever. So you know what? A lot of these, a lot of the local ones, they they didn't care much for uh, for like whether it's an eighteen or a fifteen or if it's a kid right. that's watching the movie. But then, you know, I mean, I was then, never picking up horror films. Was... To be fair, I wasn't picking up horror films. You know, I was picking up mm. martial arts films, Italian films, Bud Spencer, Terence Hill. You know, so they obviously were kids' films anyway. But yeah, they they, they ain't bothered. The Vietnamese bloke had no problem selling you. As a matter of fact, he was selling you Asian versions of these films, and they ain't got certificates on them, have they? So, I know, yeah. It's like that guy was, uh, he was cool. I mean, he, he kind of like, yeah. he just said to me, oh, he's like, yeah, fine. But then I was, I think I was about, about 15, 16 at the time when I found that shop, and I was like, just picking up a lot of these movies. And um, I mean, that was the person I was, like, I think. I pretty much had gone through all of Jet Li's filmography because of that guy, because he had a bunch of the films. This is before um, those uh, botched, uh, hacked up uh, Weinstein releases happened of like Jet Li's um, other Hong Kong works. So I was able to actually watch these films like in the original language. Yeah, how they're meant to be seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing. We go through, there's so much stuff for us to chat about because we go through those stages as well, right? So we've seen these films, we've seen them as they're meant to be seen, as you just said there. And then we see re releases of, you know, Drunken Master 2, and they changed the sound effects, called it Legend of Drunken Master. It's not even Drunken oh. Master 2. They changed the sound effects. They, they dub it and change the sound effects. And you go, well, even the sound effects are crap. What have you guys done? You've ruined this film. You're bringing it to a brand. Well, actually, it was dubbed by Chan, I think, himself. That was the only saving grace. But if you look at the fights, they were terrible, even though they were some of the best fights. They were terrible because they simply just changed the sound effects. And I went, you have finally exposed this film to an audience that haven't seen it because they like Rumble in the Bronx and whatever. And they're getting not the film. They're getting a crap version. You know, It's like a diluted kind of mix of it. And then I think... I think it's Keith Vitali said this amazing thing on, um, I think it was the, the DVD for, or, or Blu-ray for Wheels on Meals. When, when he was actually filming Wheels on Meals and he was working with Jackie, he says he learned an amazing thing. That He said before they would start like, choreographing the fight, it was Jackie would actually go back and he just do start with this. Bum, 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 bum. And he goes, what you're doing is uh, I'm coming up with a rhythm of how we should actually land the hits and like the blocks because 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 the audience are more likely to remember it because it's like a kind of a rhythm a pattern yes. that kind of subconsciously sticks with a person and that's why when you watch like for example especially drunken master 2 some i would say possibly my favorite kung fu movie of all time i you know i just think it's just the quality in the, in the, the original good. version the fights, if you watch the original language version with the original beats to the fight scenes and like the sound effects, it just kind of goes like a, it's like, the, it's just, 
high level martial arts filmmaking in that I, sense. Listen, you bang on with it. That's exactly that's exactly what it is. It's this it's this stuff that makes you it ingrains into you. So Armor of God is a perfect example for me, the rhythm that you're talking about. It's got the the bit where he's fighting all, all the all the monks where you know oh, yeah. Him, yeah, we're going now, Jackie. So we'll leave you to it. And he has to he has to beat them all up, right? There's a there's a drumming in that. Oh yeah. In the background. Oh, the music. And as that music is going ba bam, ba bam. It'll break. And there's a rhythm that goes with the music and the sound effects as well. There's the bit where he spins like yeah, bomb, ba bash, ba bomb. Yeah, he's like blocking, punching, blocking, punching. And as you say, even the, the plates, only... even the plates breaking and smashing as well. It just kind of goes with the whole symphony. It's like it's just it's amazing. And you don't know until you watch these films over and over again, and then you watch all the other crap, and you start to question why is that so good and why is this so crap. And that's when, with an adult mind, you go back and you watch it and go, oh, and there you go. And you listen to things like what Vitaly said there. And then you start to piece it together and go, man, this stuff is way better than I thought. Because I didn't know all this. We didn't have internet. We had none of this stuff, right? We had the exactly. magazine here and there. We had some DVDs that had some interviews on. We did have some information. But the truth is, mm -hmm. when we were kids, we had only the film was the only information. What we were watching was the only exactly. part of that information. Now I realize just how much effort was put in. I understand why I loved it and still love it so much. And I understand another perfect... why it smashes everything else because no yeah. one was putting the time and effort in like these guys were. And it's exactly the same with video games and, and Capcom and SNK and their hand-drawn animation. It's like fine pieces of art. You can't beat that. And it never, it it. It never dates. It still looks amazing now. Amazing. Exactly. It's like another perfect example is that is of, uh, I think it's Police Story 2, the playground fight, especially in the Hong Kong fight, because that music that's playing and the way that he's kind of like using those pipes and like blocking and hitting. It's like just kind of like. But then when you watch the, the, the Japanese version cut of it, it's like the extended cut. They removed that music and it's just kind of like. Now you need to have that music in there because it's just a better fit and it's like it goes with the rhythm of like, you know, it's him blocking and hitting and stopping and the music stops at the same time. It's like, it's just perfect symphony. Mate, uh, it's so true. And normally, if you'd ask me, would you want music in your in your fight or not? I'd say, no, I don't, I don't. Just have the good sound effects. I don't want music. I do not want music. That's That's my opinion. And when you see it in modern films, I'm right about that, as in this would be better without music. But you know what? There are some in those Hong Kong films where there is a come. It's, it's not overbearing. Overbearing. It is written. You can see it's written for the fight. It goes with it. Exactly. I think the only film that's done that's right, like in like in this century, I would say is probably The Raid. I think oh, yeah. the Raid. You know, I, didn't, I have seen that and I do like that film. I haven't seen it for years and I, and I did really like it and I like the second one as well. But the truth is, I can't comment on that like that because I never picked up on it. But that I did because I, 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 I didn't pick up on it. when you pick up on it, it's wrong. Yeah, because yeah, again, I mean, Gareth Evans I mean, is a huge fan. Yeah, if you hear it, sometimes you're watching something and there's something that's annoying you. And my mum always used to say, she, we'd be sitting in a restaurant eating and she'd go, something's irritating me, I'm not relaxed. And then it would twig and she'd go, well, it's this stinking music. And it's the same in films. I'll go, something's not right about this. And I go, it's the music, it's too much, it's too overbearing. It's wrong, it's saxophone and they're having a fight, whatever it is. And, and that's what you're saying there about the raid. You picked up on it because you watch films and you study them. So you look at them in more yeah. detail now. So you did pick up on it, but in the right way, not because it was annoying. you. So, yeah. I know it's, 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 that's just a certain quality, I think, in filmmaking, where you kind of like, if you have a good knack for it, where people like Scorsese, Tarantino, even Gareth, and even Jackie Chan have that kind of like knack where they can actually place music that starts at the right time, at the right frame, at the right movement, and ends in a perfect position as well. And like throughout that, it's just like it just seems like this piece of music was made just for this scene. For this scene, yeah. Even if it um, weren't, yeah, yeah. I wonder what exactly. comes first. Say they would just take Jackie Chan as the example. Does he 
make the fight and then a music bloke puts the music to the fight? Or does he do it at the same time and go, oh, I've got this bit of music and I'll make it work with a fight? I wonder how it works so seamless because it can't be luck. It's too good. It can't it's, be luck. I, th I think he, he did kind of touch upon it in one of his interviews about like, I think it was when uh, asking about how his films back then, like, films like, for example, Police Story 3, Drunken Master 2, Rumble in the Bronx and all these films were being re-released in the uh, in the US and they were being mm. re-scored. And he said he it actually spent a lot of time just finding the right music or working with a composer to kind of like make yeah. sure that they use the right music with the editing that kind of just goes with it. And you know, it takes a lot of time and effort to do, which I could imagine, yeah, that would actually editing itself is a lengthy process. But then right. he said that. You know, they said they wanted to change the music, and he thought, you know what, I don't want to stop someone else making kind of making a living. So he said, you know what, you can just change it for this release. Yeah, yeah. I but, mean, you know, it's, it must be frustrating for him, but they'll also be telling him, there's a reason it's not released here. There's a reason you're not as popular as you should be here. We know what we're doing. But he's been told that. He's been told it with a big brawl. He's been told it with a protector. He's been told that all these years. Just have a bit of faith in your own thing and say, no, this is my product. Don't ruin it. Don't ruin it. I want them to see it as it was meant to be seen. You know, exactly. He said he was going in interview that he knows his formula works for all audiences, young, old, mm. wherever country. He knows it. And he trusted that. And he's right. He's right. Exactly. He's kind of like, you know, he, he proved, he's proved them wrong because, like, I mean, yeah, it's like, even, for example, personally, I would say, uh, for me, I think the worst Jackie Chan film I've ever seen is The Protector. I just think it was that was just like a terribly made film. It was just absolutely it was it is a stinker. Even after watching it on Blu-ray, there's no redeemable quality of filmmaking in that movie. The fights are sloppy. The cinematography is just atrocious at times, and it, you know, the script and the direction is just terrible. I mean, that's when I mean Ben Shapiro. Well, I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry. What's his name? Uh, James Lickenhouse, he has a very high kind of like, kind of ego where he, he thinks he's kind of like, his contemporaries are people like Martin Scorsese and Brian De Palma and all, but I'm like, no, you're not, you're nowhere near on the same ranks of Scorsese uh, and such because they make good movies and your movies suck. And like, the fact is Jackie hated working on that movie. He went to make police story. He says, I'm going to make my own cop movie. And wow. which one's, which one, which one has stood the test of time? It's, it's right. police story. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there were a few things about the protector that I did like. Um, obviously there's the 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 Asian cuts of it where he reshot some of the fight scenes, added some. No, they, were they were better. They were better than the yeah, better yeah, that, than that the way better. But as I saw it on VHS back in the days, there were many things that even back then, as a true Chan can do no wrong, even back then, I went, Oof, within two seconds, he's swearing. Don't like it. It wasn't it what I wanted to see. Odd. Odd. It, it was like odd. It. it was some. There you go. It was odd. There was some nudity in it. Okay, I was young. Of course, I liked it. Didn't want to see it in a Jackie Chan film. Didn't want it in there. <laughs> Didn't want it. Right. Didn't want it in there. Did do like Danny Aiello. Still like Danny Aiello. He's he's brilliant. Love Chan. He looked wicked in it. You had skin tight jeans, white trainers, that green bomber jacket, and a wicked barnet. And I went, you know what? He looks amazing in this film. Yeah, the style looked, was good, but. Yeah. I just think he was, you know, it, 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 he was heavily miscast in that film. Yeah, of course. Of you know, course. it just did yeah. not suit Jackie Chan. Like, that was not yeah. a Jackie Chan type. I mean, that's something that Steven Seagal would normally do, you know? It's like, just, yeah. well, I was like... Oh, no, he's would like, like, like that, like the hard cop thing. It weren't that kind of thing. Whereas, you know, Rush Hour, on the other hand, was suited him way better, you know? just Oh, yeah. Just, Rush yeah. Hour was, was pretty much a Jackie Chan movie because that was a film that kind of, like, had a character that suited yeah. him at best. And I mean, he has improved as an actor though. I mean, I do kind of like, when I look into like uh, Jackie Chan's more recent kind of like filmography, he has done films like, for example, um, The Shinjuku Incident with, uh, that was directed yeah, by Gold. His, his acting was really good. And even um, that, uh, that movie, The Foreigner. Uh, yeah, he was good Pierre in that Berman. as well, yeah, agreed. Yeah. You know, he's, he's matured a lot. He could do serious roles, but I think at that time, I just don't think it was like 
you know, it was like that was just a kind of a mismatch of a movie. And no, I just listen, like, I agree. I've picked out some things and and that I like about it, and you can see the kind of things I've had to pick out. Right, I'm not clutching at straws. I did like those things, but it was it was uh yeah, it's a bad one, I suppose. Overall, it's a bad one, but it's a bad movie overall. Yeah, yeah. but but I haven't rewatched it for years, so I've only got. I mean, I haven't. I've only got my kid memories of it, and even they are bad. But like I say, I will always dig out the good because I still have fond memories of it, and I still watched it loads at the time. But I knew, even though I didn't know why, I knew this wasn't a real Jackie Chan film. I knew it weren't. Well, first off, it had Danny Aiello in it. Not that I knew who he was at the time. I was only a kid. However, I just went, this don't feel right. Nothing. The music, the mm -hmm. even the picture quality. Nothing was right. Like I said, he swore. There was things in there that I went, this ain't a real chance. So, no, I, I didn't like it. It wasn't one that I always said, oh, you know, most of these films, I would have friends around, friends and family around, and I'd go, you've got to come and watch this. I never did that with The Protector, and there's a reason for that. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I, I wouldn't do it. But you're talking about Chan's acting. There's so many things to chat about, Sid, but I've got to do it because I'll forget. You're talking about Chan's acting. Let's go all the way back to The Young Master and the bit yeah. where the teacher – you know, he's having a right dig at Tiger, smashing him up, this, that, and the other, and hitting him, and the other students, he's bashing them and hitting them, and eventually oh, yeah. Chan breaks, and he says in the English dub, stop right now, or something like that, and his hand comes up. Oh, stop now! And even in English dub, which is how I saw it originally, I was like, you know what, this acting, me and my brother used to watch it and go, this is brilliant Chan acting. The veins were popping in his neck and his throat, <laughs> and you could see the red face and the tears and his barnet, and it was amazing. And he eventually collapsed to his knees from the energy exhausted. It was just like, <sighs> like that, and then he runs out or whatever. To me, I knew I knew that was brilliant acting. Then later on, we saw it with the original Cantonese and went, "Well, I knew it was brilliant acting. You could see it." So it he had brilliant. it in him. He had it in him. Yeah, he, he, he's. Very few people have that kind of a charisma. It's like Bruce Lee again, Jackie Chan, you know, and a uh, few actors like here and there like that stand out. Like, you know, there's a reason why their films are kind of like revered and their their acting abilities. Like, even for example, when you watch something as great as like um, as as you know, some something like for example, The Killer or A Better Tomorrow. You see, like, um, Chay and Fats acting, and you just think that, yeah. you know what, this guy, is, he's a timeless actor because they just have great screen presence yes. and they know how it works for filmmaking. And I think Jackie Chan has kind of has still has that same kind of, like, energy where he can kind of, like, turn a movie that might might be, that's, you know, if it was anybody else that was in it, that, uh, that would have been a complete stinker. So, you he know, he knows what have, worked for him, and that's why when other people try and do it for him, we smell it. We know. It's it's like the yeah. biggest example is the remake of The Karate Kid, which was um, with uh, Jaden Smith and Jackie Chan. I mean, the film yeah. itself, yeah, it was okay, but you know, it wasn't great. But Jackie Chan was amazing. And he, even really? Western critics are like, he's the best thing in that whole movie. Yeah, he was good. He was good. And Heart of the Dragon, him and Sammo Hung. Chan oh, does some yeah. brilliant acting in that, right? I mean, he got the opportunity. It was a drama. Um that's annoying, that film, because they always... I don't know if you know the scene, but there's a scene in a car park where Mang Hoi and Leo Sang, and there's loads of them there. Yeah, that was for the Japanese the market. market, yeah. Never in, never in the film. I know. We only, we only got to see, I think it was in the uh, in the late 90s when MIA Video uh, re out a lot of the old Jackie films. Uh, they did, like, a special edition, which is the extended cut, because that was those fight scenes were only included in the uh, the Japanese cut, mm. whereas the international version and the Hong Kong version was without those two fights where it's actually with the fight scene at the hospital and the fight yeah, the scene beginning, in the... Right at the uh, beginning, that's right, yeah. There's one right at the beginning combat. as well, isn't there? Yeah. But then if, you, if you've seen the 88 films uh, Blu-ray, they've I'm actually got... It, I've it. Yeah. Is it yeah, in there? It's got, it's got the full version, yeah, and it's all like, you know, remastered oh, HD. Has. Yes, it's got it's got two cuts on that on that Blu-ray. Okay, well that that's good news because I thought you were going to say they gave us the scenes, but they put them there as extras. No, I want them in the film. As I'm no, watching. they've got a move, they've got a version with okay. the actual um, oh, good. with the scenes. Like they've got two two versions of the film on that Blu-ray. Well, brilliant. Well, you know, what it, whatever the word is, kudos to them then because I do have that and I haven't put it on thinking. Oh, I wonder, but yeah, 
I mean, such a great film, but it's always been ruined for many, many years. Yeah, the first time I saw those scenes, I had a, an old bootleg of it. You know, I can't tell you what version it was because it was just a bootleg. I don't know. But it had the hospital scene at the beginning when he drops the bloke off or whatever, backflips off the counter and all that. And then it had the bit in the car park. And I went, this film is... And then it had all the drama. It had everything, right? So as a film, I yeah. went, this is brilliant. And for years, I just thought, this is another one of these films where I know it's a drama. I know it doesn't necessarily need those action bits, but it's better with them and makes it a bit more of a Chan film. Um, you know, it's a shame because it was ruined for many years. So yeah. I, mean, I know, but then I, I still say, that even though the film, it never got as much love when it first came out, but that end fight scene in the, the building site is just probably one of the most amazing, like, serious fight scenes that Jackie Chan's done. Well, we were just discussing about violence. That's a violent scene. It is. You know what I'm saying? Oh, Chan, no violence, this, that, and the other. I know Samo's on there, so he'd probably be heavily involved. And let's face it, his fighting was a lot more brutal than Chan's. It always yeah, has right. been from the traditions all the way up to modern. We could tell the difference. But yeah, that particular spade and bits of wood and... And uh, in, in the extent... Everything, it, right? That's got some... I, know, there's a, I didn't have some pickaxe and that cut out of it and all. Yeah, there, there was a scene that was cut out that's actually in the, the full-length version where he's actually he's just kind of impaled the guy with the pickaxe in the chest. I was like, Yeah, okay. I, rem I remember but that was all, yeah, that was also cut out. But this bootleg I had was brilliant. Okay, well, if it's all there, I'll definitely give that a rewatch because... Oh, yeah, yeah you get a 2K awesome. restoration of the movie. I mean, it just looks great as well. You're like, wow, you've actually got this whole movie now in 2K with, like, those uh, those amazing, those, those scenes. And just kind of... It, it's the best way to watch it, I would say, definitely. Okay. Well, look, I'll do it. But look, we've got loads of things to discuss. We don't want to bore people too long. I'm not bored. I could chat about this stuff for ages. Same here, man. I can chat about it. Well, I know that now. This is the truth. This is the, the real truth now. When I said I've not met Sid before, this was absolute truth. I only do real stuff. I've not met him before. I've never, apart from on his videos on his YouTube channel, I've not seen his face in the flesh or anything apart from there. Now it's still not in the flesh. It's still on a video. But you know what I mean? Now I'm actually meeting yeah. you for the first time. Now I get that energy and go, man, this guy is like me. He can talk about this stuff forever. And I'm the same. So we can do, but we won't because I've got martial arts to do. I even want to chat to you about the Bollywood stuff and the links there because obviously I used to watch, not obviously, but I'll let you know. I did used to watch a lot. That's of more my family's thing. I watch them up like I'm not really overtly huge fan of that stuff. It's like, it just no. doesn't kind of appeal to me. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I liked it because sometimes it came along. I'm not going to say why now, right? But anyway, there's that to talk about. There's the other martial arts stuff to talk about. I want to chat to you more about some of these new releases, not because, um, oh, they're brilliant. They're bringing them all out and they're all great. I just want to talk to you in general about the new ones and stuff. There's lots of stuff to pick up on. We have, I now know that you'll want to do it and happy to oh, do it. Oh, yes. Oh, hell yes. yes. Right, me too. Right, that's what it's all about. So, look, thanks, Sid. If anyone wants to uh follow Sid, he's cool movie gram. I'll put it up on the screen or whatever. That's where he is. He's got a YouTube you. channel where he chats about the films, he reviews them, he does unboxings, uh, reviews, gives him a score out of five on whatever. The latest one I think I saw on there was on the Shaw Brothers film, uh, Monkey Kung Fu. That was the last video I've done. <laughs> oh, just having yeah. that hard time. <laughs> oh, nice. No, listen, th th a, that's another thing I want to talk to you. Honestly, genuinely, that's another thing I want to talk to you about. YouTube channels, how you find it, how you get on with it. I I'd like to talk to you about that as well, because we'll have very similar yeah. views, I, I should think, on that as well. So that's another thing for us to cover. And there might mm -hmm. be other people that are also interested in that, because it's, I don't want to say it's not easy, like, oh, it's difficult or whatever, but it's um, you have to do it for the love of it is what I'll say. It is, yeah. Uh, if I want money, I've got a, I've got a full time job, so you know that's that's pretty much how I burn my bread and butter. But I just do this because I enjoy making videos, and like, yeah, if it gets to a point where I do, I'm not going to kind of shun it. But you know, if I can make money from it, I'll be like, hey, thanks, you know, right? And every little helps. But it's I don't necessarily just do YouTube for the money. I mean, I'm, I'm well, of course it for we can't because there's none, <laughs> there isn't any, so we can't do it for the money. But yeah, that you always have to remember that. It's a difficult one because it's about whether you've got the time and energy to put into it because obviously there's so many other things to do. But I yeah. just keep going back to it because I love the stuff and it's a way. Look now, out it, I wouldn't be. I might connect with you. That's another thing I want to chat because you're up in Birmingham, so I don't know what events and stuff you've been to in the past. There's a load of things to cover, Sid. 
I'm going to stop because I won't. I have to stop myself. I'm going to stop myself. <laughs> yeah. Go on, right. And I'm not going to. So I'll, I'll, we'll reconvene later and we'll have a chat. Sid, cool movie gram. Instagram as well. He's on there yeah. as well. I'm going to say this while I've got the opportunity. I thank you for your support because Sid's always been brilliant to me as soon as he, as soon as both of us knew that we existed, you know, we liked and commented on each other's stuff all the time. I appreciate that, Sid. It's nice of you. And obviously that's no worries, how man. Doing this. Yeah, I appreciate it too, man. Thank you very much. Nice one, mate. Anything else? Anything else you want to say? With Sid, cool movie, Graham. Look, Sid, thanks, mate. Thanks for the chat. I bloody enjoyed it. It was fantastic. Appreciate the chat. Loads of things covered. No Thanks for agreeing to come on as well, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, man, I was hoping because I was hoping one day he's going to ask me. I, was, I can't wait. You know, I'm not, I'll get, I'll, if you, I, I was like, I was thinking if Ultimate Fight Clan, Steve asks me to do a video with him, I'll be like, you know what? I fucking do it, man. I don't care. I'm doing it because I watch this stuff and I'm thinking this guy's like, you know, again, I thought someone's passionate about martial arts movies and Hong Kong action stuff, and I was like, yeah, this, he knows, like, you know, he knows those kind of things, and I'm like, definitely, I would love to kind of, like, go on there and just chat with him, because I could see myself, like, as we have, we've had a really good chat. Definitely, listen, look, Sid, man, that, I, I really appreciate you saying that, mate, it means a hell of a lot for you to no worries, say that to me, I, I, I really appreciate that, mate, um, you, you You'll never know truly how much, but thank you so much for, for yeah, saying that. Um, I'd like I would like to say um, if you guys, because I'm part of the Asian Cinema Circle as well, which is a collective of other um, like fellow YouTubers, like you got Hong Kong Blu-rays, Hong Kong Cinema Appreciation Society, um, a Touch of Film, um, Martial Arts Film Freak, and all these people. Some in the UK, some in the States, and whatnot. Absolutely, check out the Asian Cinema Circle on YouTube. Really good YouTubers as well. They've got some amazing content. Is that the name and of the channel? And also subscribe and check out my stuff too. That I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> well, that, that absolutely. You know, it's uh, you, you can see now anyone who you know who. I mean, I don't have a big massive following either, but anyone who does, you can now see that Sid knows his stuff. He loves the stuff, and that's what it's all about. It's about connecting with like-minded people who love this stuff. And you can yeah, see this guy loves his stuff as 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 do I. So yeah, cool movie Graham. Um Sid, mate. Thank you. Excellent to meet you. Love mm -hmm. the chat and I'll see you again soon, man. Thanks a lot. Keep it Definitely. up. Yeah. Definitely. You too. Keep it Take up, care. See you later. <laughs>